So my story is very much about the Glasgow boys and the Scottish colourists. It's about half and half. It's a lot to take on. You could easily have a lecture on one or the other. But in some ways, it's nice to put them together because it shows you where all the influences, influences are coming from. And they are definitely coming from France. There's an obvious omission here. And that's Charles Rennie Mackintosh and his wife, Margaret MacDonald Mackintosh. They don't fit my story at all. Because although they were part of the avant-garde movement in the 1890s, they did not look for Fran to France for inspiration. The boys and the girls, and they were so named, obviously, after the events. There's over 20 in the group, and I'm only showing you a selection. But they were influenced by French Impressionism and French Naturalism. So I'm showing you at the top in Kukubri in watercolour, a rather lovely image by George Henry. And they painted so many cabbages, they actually were known as the cabbage painters. Immediately below, it is also by George Henry, but now this is from the 1893-94 campaign uh, that he and Atkinson Hornell undertook to Japan. And uh, this is a, a landmark in terms of the influence of Japanese art on art in Glasgow, because as I say, for the most part, the influence is coming from France. So in the first generation, it's French Impressionism and uh, French Naturalism. And uh, for our Scottish colorists, the influences are still coming from France, but now we're thinking in terms of the Fauves and Cubism. So this is almost like um, how these major art movements uh, influenced our native painters, and by native, obviously, I mean Scotland. So just to remind you of the, the sort of cultural wars going on between Glasgow and Edinburgh. So here we have a lovely view out over Carlton Hill towards the castle in Edinburgh. And it, the famous painting of Sir Henry Raven could almost be taken as a logo, of not only for Scottish art, but also in a way uh, for the Scottish psyche. A little doer, very serious. Um, the famous uh, common philosophy that many Scots adopted in the 18th century, down to earth. And uh, I love the fact that he's in his best bib and tucker, as you can see, skating across a frozen Scottish lock. Very much this was the Athens of the North, and uh, Edinburgh had all the major institutions, the Royal Academies, that again underpinned any sort of cultural renaissance. And that cultural renaissance in Scotland begins really in the 19th century, as we'll see in a minute. But this is Glasgow. It's dirty. It doesn't have any of the sort of cultural um, background that Edinburgh has in terms of institutions. It's young and it's brash, but it's second city of the empire. So there's a lot of wealth pouring in, in the, particularly um, in the 1880s and 1890s, sort of ex exemplified really by people like uh, you know, the wonderful collection um, at Pollock Park. Um, and shipping in particular, both building on the Clyde and also um, just trade in general to do with the transcontinental, but by transcontinental, I mean shipping between Scotland and Canada and America. So very different cousins, if I could put it that way, between uh, Edinburgh and Glasgow. So there is a major uh, shift in the late 19th century in terms of Scottish artists appearing on the stage in London and making a name for themselves. So William Quiller, Quiller Orchard, so it's a good example of that. And I'm showing you here a classic glue pot. They were known as glue pots because they, they darkened their canvases down uh, to make them look more like old masters. And this marriage of convenience is typical of the type of narrative painting that the Victorians both preferred and understood. It's what we call a problem painting because as you can see, uh, the elderly gentleman has married a much younger wife. And the butler, I'd love to put a balloon in his mouth. He's probably saying something like, what a silly old duffer. You know, why did he go and uh, take this risk and marry somebody so young? And this is known as the marriage of convenience. There's also one called the first cloud. And there's one that sort of follows on to show uh, that our old duffer has been abandoned uh, by his young wife.
So we, very much in the 19th century, expected paintings to tell a story. They may not have always been easy to understand because they were left, as I said, to be a little problematic and you were able to make up your own narrative. But we always, in the 19th century, in terms of popular arts, expected this sort of narrative. So the Glasgow boys broke away from that. They were very much influenced by new radical ideas coming from France. The aesthetic movement was flourishing in the 1870s. And that was arguing that a painting really didn't have to have a narrative. It didn't have to be based on some historical subject or mythology or, or anything sort of like obvious in terms of representation. It should be much more about the senses. That's exactly what aesthetics means of the senses. So for this a new generation of artists who were breaking away from the Royal Academy uh, tuition, they were looking for paintings that concentrated on color and uh, form and light. And they frequently wanted to paint uh, modern life. So this is by Edward Arthur Walton, one of the famous Glasgow boys related to the architect George Walton, and it's simply entitled En Plein Air. It's currently owned, or it was as far as I know uh, at the moment, by Lord McFarlane of Bear's Den. So I want to emphasise that if you want to see Glasgow boys and Scottish colourists, you're largely going to have to travel to Glasgow and Edinburgh. Uh, they were collected uh, by their own haute bourgeois and uh, classes and have ended up if they are in national institutions in Scotland. Uh, there's also many in private hands. So this is called En Plein Air to emphasize the revolution that takes part in European arts in the 1870s in particular, but with the shift to Impressionism, which meant painting directly from nature out of doors in a, a flickering technique that captured movement and light. Now in this instance, we're actually looking at a watercolor, but I want you to particularly notice how the base of the carriage and the horse has dissolved into a sort of like vapor to represent all the dust being kicked up by the horse. You can also see the unusual composition as our two ladies crossing the road, and they are clearly, as you can see, a high society ladies, have left a void on the other side. And this is partly the influence of photography and even more so partly the influence of the Japanese print, as we will see later. First of all, let's just consider this whole idea of en plein air, because we've been sketching out of doors directly from nature in watercolors, in fact, for many years, right the way back to the mid 18th century. But it was this revolution of being able to take one's oils out of doors and to paint directly from nature. As seen here, uh, John Lavery is often referred to as the Irish Glasgow boy, as he's from Northern Ireland. And this is simply entitled Principal Street at Grey. And at Grey is Chiloan, we'll hear more about it later, was the artist colony just outside Paris that so many European artists gravitated to in the 1880s. You can see here that we have coloured shadows, they're no longer black, and the subject matter is quite modest, but of course the central motif is the artist at work. In the shadow, he doesn't need his umbrella. But many did indeed use umbrellas, because that had cast a more even light over the canvas. And uh, in a minute I'll show you how this revolution uh, really is facilitated, uh, but perhaps the most important thing was the fact that the oil paints were now pre-mixed and in metal tubes. Newton and Windsor was one of the major producers. So here we've got a lady artist. This is the era when lady artists come to the fore. They have better education, particularly at the slave from 1871. And my lady here, as you can see, is getting an even light over her canvas by using a sunshade or an umbrella. So a lot of mobility was achieved uh, two ways. Railways basically took you anywhere that you wanted to go. And you could take your oil paints with you as opposed to your watercolours uh, thanks to a pochade uh, painting box. And always know there's a French pochade painting box because all of this sort of like revolution of painting directly out of doors uh, from nature seems to be very much focused on this sort of naturalism 
and then the Impressionism um, instigated by artists like Monet in particular. However, the rather nice sketch at the top uh, is showing you one of the dangers of painting directly from nature out of doors. In this case, in Scotland, we've got lots of midges. Carl Larson on this side, painting directly from nature, is doing it in the snow. I always worry that all of the paints in his box uh, might be freezing. And he's got special sort of uh, straw boots on to keep his feet warm. At the other end of the spectrum from Carl Larson, who's Swedish, uh, we have uh, a chap called Croyer painting at Skeyen, which is right at the tip of Jutland in Denmark, where there was again a very healthy and um, international school of artists, a, a colony in fact, that would go to paint every summer. And then this is a rather uh, amusing cartoon of Sir John Lavery using one of these poche, I can't say it, poche shade painting boxes. And they're still used and they're very specialised. So I'm actually showing one, if you want to, to buy one, this is actually available on the internet. You can see that there's uh, somewhere to stack your brushes, uh, that all your paints would be in here. And then you have a sliding easel, but you're restricted to a certain extent by, you know, by the actual size of the box in terms of the size of your canvas, which at this stage could well be card or paper, uh, as well as, you know, conventional canvas. The important thing is that this box enabled you to travel freely and to allow you to paint particularly during the summer months, and everybody gravitated towards colonies. It was uh, a way of uh, sort of keeping a sort of friendship going amongst artists. If you think that all of these artists are for the most part outsiders, they're not yet part of the establishments, they may be studying at the Royal Academy schools, but they're rebelling, so they get a certain amount of mutual support uh, by forming these brotherhoods. And the brotherhoods uh, went out during the summer months to paint uh, appropriate motifs. And they would gravitate towards Kukubri, which is the summer house that you see here. And then the bridge, believe it or not, here um, is at Crowland in Lincolnshire, uh, where several Glasgow boys went to paint, which is quite difficult to understand, as that area of Lincolnshire is particularly flat. And then hard at it is at Coburn, uh, which again attracted many artists, uh, forming one of these mutually supportive uh, colonies. And all of those works there are by James Guthrie. So here are the Glasgow boys. Now I've cherry picked the ones that I like, I'll be perfectly honest. Uh, so, uh, so James Guthrie, you'll see that he, he does, he eventually becomes rich and successful and will become a pillar of the establishment, particularly in Edinburgh, where all the institutions were. E.A. Walton, who I've mentioned already, as he comes from a very artistic family. He has a sister, Hannah, and a brother, George. George is the one who is the architect. Uh, George Henry and Atkinson Hornell, who you see at the top here, they were very much brothers in art, painted alongside each other in Kukubri, uh, where Atkinson Hornell settled. Uh, but also they are the pair that went to Japan. And then uh, Joseph Prawhall, I was trying to, to get my memory uh, to remember Burrell and the Burrell collection in Pollock Park. And uh, Burrell was particularly keen on Prawhall, who largely worked in watercolours. So you'll see many of his works um, in the Burrell collection. And Burrell made all of his money from shipping. And then Sir John Lavery down the bottom of the Glasgow Boys, and you can see that quite a few of them rise to the ranks. Not only do they become academicians, uh, but they also are knighted. And uh, they sort of, they get their name, Glasgow Boys, because many of them were shown as a group at the Glasgow Institute exhibition in February 1883. Though like many names, it was applied retrospectively to the Glasgow Boys. So initially, they're very influenced by what is known as European realism, which kicks off with this, uh, Corbet's a burial or funeral at Ornon. This was seen to be a radical or revolutionary painting, as it broke with mythology and history painting, and tackled a modern life subject with almost photographic realism. Whenever I look at it, I also think that I might be looking at, you know, 
that the women in the village, you wouldn't want to argue with them, would you? They do look like they might be better at home in Macbeth. Um, it, it doesn't look at a happy group. And at the time, even the French were alarmed by the, godless, the godlessness of the painting as the burial is actually taking place down here. Uh, many people said it was almost like reportage and that the subject was ugly and essentially unpleasant uh, because it wasn't particularly showing rural life um, in a very positive, um, you know, in a very positive light. The Highland Funeral by Sir James Guthrie appears to be directly related to it, as you can see, in that you've got this continuous skein of figures. And in the case of a high, Highland Funeral, it's a very sad story, this one. Uh, uh, according to the, you know, the experts, it was inspired by a, a child, unfortunately, uh, drowning. Uh, this was reported in the local newspapers, and this inspired a Highland Funeral. So it's a child, I'm afraid that you're seeing here um, about to be buried. And there are no women present, as of course in the Victorian era, particularly in the Highlands, it was seen to be a male only affair um, in terms of the actual funeral it itself, it's the funeral itself. So the reportage element is important, the naturalism and this idea of choosing modern life subjects, but most importantly, modern life rural subjects as opposed to urban ones. They did tend to see life in the countryside through rose-tinted spectacles. There was this idea that living on the land uh, was healthy and rejuvenating. They tend to sweep over the darker sides of living um, in the countryside, uh, poverty, the fact that many are itinerant, the fact that many don't own the land that they're working. But nevertheless, you can see here in this painting by Jules Bastien Lepage, this almost heroic way that peasants are painted. Bastien Lepage was the most influential artist working in France around 1880. He actually unfortunately dies young in 1884. And in fact, it was his death in 1884 that provoked a massive retrospective of his work, which meant that he became even more famous in death. His technique was very much inspired by photography. So you can see that this young lady didn't have to hold that pose all the time. He could use photographs as an aid. But most importantly, his technique is very unusual with a very intensely painted middle foreground, a less intensely painted a middle ground, and then it tends to fade towards the background, just like a photograph. And you can see here again, my work by James Guthrie, a Heinz daughter, uh, has picked up on a lot of the technique used by Bastien Lepage particularly a technique known as the square brush technique. And as I said earlier, they painted cabbages so often that they became rather cruelly nicknamed uh, the cabbage painters. Now the boys all come from very different backgrounds and Guthrie is a case in point. He was destined to be a lawyer before he rebelled, was largely supported in his ambitions to be an artist by his mother. So uh, they don't all come with a, a gilded spoon, as you're about to discover. But what binds them all together is the desire to paint directly from nature out of doors. And this will encourage them to travel. So initially, the Glasgow boys look for local areas like uh, Coburn, like Kukubri. But it's not long before they travel further afield. So George Clausen, who's actually part Danish and part Scottish. Uh, you'll find him painting in Brittany, alongside Stanhope Forbes, who's a member of the famous Newland School. So this whole idea of going to France to look for rural subjects, particularly in Normandy and in Brittany, and this idea of clubbing together into some sort of brotherhood is a European phenomenon of the 1880s. So you can see that my subject matter is picked up here by James Guthrie's first significant success to pastures new. The impact of photography is seen here very clearly as one of the geese is cut off mid-body. And you really do feel as though the little girl is herding the geese across the picture plane. It also has a very low horizon and a high sky, because of course it's painted in Lincolnshire. Uh, so of course it's got one of those very atmos atmospheric skies. 
Uh, alongside uh, Guthrie painting, this is their, their painting in Lincolnshire, uh, we have a work here by Joseph Crawhall. And I'm going to show you a close up of this in a minute. So uh, rather than the sort of grandeur of the, the mountains, the highlands, here we have Crawhall, a great friend of um, Sir William Burrell and big collection there, as I mentioned earlier. And you've got Guthrie painting alongside each other in Lincolnshire. Quite what you and I might call pedestrian subjects. Though I do love this one of the cattle standing in water and uh, the swifts. And I've got a close up to show you what I mean about the square brush technique. This may be something that you are familiar with as an artist. But basically you have a very broad brush. Um, but if you then use the edge of it, it becomes a very fine line. So you can see here where they've dragged the brush across to create this large and uh, rather irregular brushwork. And then they'll use the edge of it to create things like the, uh, the swifts that are flying across the canvas. So the technique of these artists is really important and is largely down to Bastien Lepage rather than the French Impressionists, who by, of course, the early 1880s were increasingly uh, well established. Uh, the first French Impressionist exhibition is held in 1874. So we're around about 10 years after that. So Guthrie is in the orchard here. It's painted partly at Coburn and partly at Kukubri. It's a very large canvas. One of the ways in which these artists challenged the conventions of the era was to paint on a very grand scale. We also have a version of the orchard in watercolour, a series created as a gift by the Glasgow Art Club and presented to the Prince and Princess of Wales, that's Edward, uh, by the Lord Provost upon the opening of the International Exhibition in Glasgow in 1888. This was a really important event and really puts Glasgow on the cultural map as opposed to Edinburgh. So, as, as mentioned, in the orchard, it was partly painted in Kukubri, which was where Atkinson Hornell uh, uh, ventured most summers. And in fact, in the end, he came so attached to, to Kukubri, he stayed there even during the winters. You could say that these colonies were very much focused on summer painting. The one at the top is entitled In the Town Crops, and looking across the cabbages, you can see, of course, Kukubri in the background. If you've ever been there, you'll know it's like in, it's a perfectly preserved uh, Scottish village, largely thanks to Hornell, who uh, began to buy up buildings uh, as they became available. And then uh, down the bottom in watercolour, uh, we have his friend George Henry. And again, Henry and Hornell are frequently uh, painting alongside each other in the Cotter's Garden. And the Hornell a potato planting could all, almost be read as a sort of ages of man with the elderly uh, gentleman, the farmer, hoeing and the young girl in the background. Again, all painted essentially in the style of Jules Bastien Lepage. This uh, theme is picked up here directly because you'll actually see La Pauvre Fauvette, the little sparrow, if you go to visit Kelvin Grove, which is the big art gallery in the centre of Glasgow. And you can see here how they, the Glasgow boys are so influenced by Bastien Lepage that they even borrow motifs. So the, the cropped tree in the centre, the rather strange way in which the cow appears to be floating um, is picked up here. And uh, so the Atkinson Hornell one is called Resting. Uh, the George Henry one is experimenting with the contrast between shadow and then the bright sunlight be beyond and the verticality of the application of paint. And then going back to watercolour with George Henry, again, we have the Cabbage Girl. So again, you're back to this whole idea of the Cabbage School. Whilst Hornell, Henry are discovering Kukubri, and whilst Guthrie is concentrating on Coburn and um, the Trossacks, uh, the uh, destination for John Lavery is Great Chilouin. Grace Uruguay is a small village, uh, not that far from Fontainebleau. It was within easy reach of Paris and quickly became an artist colony. There's nothing particularly exceptional about it in terms of major landmarks, apart from the bridge. I think it was more than anything, it was, it was this ease of, of getting to it, um, you know, from Paris. And it becomes the most important and largest international artist colony 
really, in Europe at this time, attracting many from Scandinavia. So Christian Krogh is actually Norwegian, and is the master of Edvard Munch. Carl Larsson, a name you might recognize, is Swedish. Christian Skredsvik is Norwegian. William Stottom Oldham is, as it says on the ticket, uh, from Oldham. But there were lots of Glasgow boys that gravitated to Grace Joa. Uh, David Gould is an, another good example. He was painting there throughout the 80s and the 90s. And the Irish painter, Frank O'Meara, actually lived in Great Chilowa for 11 years. I mean, inevitably showing you John Lavery's On the Bridge at Grey, um, because as you can see, he's come with his painting equipment, because this colony was all about painting directly from nature on plein air. This is a beautiful painting by Lavery. We're back to peasants, as you can see, um, but sort of rather cleaned up peasants is what I think I would say. And I particularly wanted to show you the scale of these paintings. It's the fact that they are painting peasant subjects that used to be sort of cabinet size on, on this sort of monumental scale. And there's a little bit again of the problem picture here as we are imagining some sort of conversation between the guy boating and our lady who with presumably is out to hang up the washing, as you can see from the foreground. You can see the famous bridge um, in the background. And my close up again is just to emphasize that this is all about technique. So the, the Glasgow boys were much more focused as the French are on how they painted or rather than what they painted. The motif was really a vehicle to an exploration of form and color and light. And they were very much using the thick impasto technique of Bastien Lepage. So Lavery's first uh, breakthrough comes with the Glasgow International Exhibition of 1888. He becomes, in effect, the unofficial recorder of the exhibition. At this stage, he's also showing the influence of James McNeil Whistler, who had strong connections to Glasgow. Uh, facing a lack of recognition in England, it was Glasgow University that gave Whistler an honorary degree. And this explains why when he died in 1903, um, his collection goes to the Hunterian in Glasgow. He stipulated above all else <sighs> that it should not go to anywhere in England, as he never felt he was given due recognition. And this Whistlerian uh, tonality is very obvious here. And in the openings, this is like showing a view across the exhibition um, spaces with what looks like Kelvin Grove in the background, but in fact, that was a, a temporary building. And uh, one of, as I say, one of the reasons why uh, there is this close attachment between Whistler and Glasgow was that Glasgow bought this, the famous portrait of uh, Thomas Carlyle, classic Whistler. So he painted, as you can see, in tones. During, so to, uh, getting this project or this uh, plum job to be unofficial recorder of the exhibition encouraged the young John Lavery to go into what we refer to as society painting. Now I mentioned that Guthrie uh, started out, uh, his family wanted him to become a lawyer, but he went sideways into painting. Lavery has a very precarious uh, start in life, orphaned at a very early age and brought up by a variety of relatives we find him living rough on the streets of Glasgow before he finally finds a footing in a, photographer's, a photographic studio uh, retouching paintings. So again, it's quite interesting looking at the sort of um, rags to riches stories, which will also be part and parcel of the Glasgow story. So here he is doing extremely well painting society. So this is a larger version of the tennis party and took the gold medal at the Paris Salon. And although the croquet match is only, what, less than 10 years later, 1893, you can see that his palette has started to get higher in terms of its coloration. That wonderful blue uh, ski, not sky, but blue sea in the background. But please note throughout the importance of movement and the way they tint their shadows which was very much the influence of French Impressionism. As we move into the 90s, in fact, the influence of French Impressionism becomes much more overt. So remember the first exhibition oh, yeah. of the French Impressionist, Monet, Renoir, Sisley and Bizarro, is as early as 1874. And here we are in the 90s, picking up on many of those themes. The flickering paintwork, 
the dappled light coming through the trees, but above all, the extremely commercially successful subject of painting society. This is Guthrie's Midsummer. Lavery's higher key is due, uh, in terms of colour, is due to him falling in love with Tangier. He goes to visit in 1891, having completed a massive sort of like documentary uh, canvas of the Queen's visit, her first one, uh, to Glasgow for the International Exhibition. He falls in love with Tangier, and the painting at the top is known as the White City, for obvious reasons, that dates to 1893. And they'll actually buy a house in Tangier in 1903, so it will be a regular holiday destination. Down the bottom, he's painting from a rooftop. So the images I'm showing you are all slightly different, but show you his oeuvre. So along the beach, from a high viewpoint, from the top of a roof, here looking out over the sea, and then a street scene down the bottom. And some of them, like the street scene down the bottom, is rather sketchy. So it's not a finished work, but a, a, a preparatory one. Lavery made his money really uh, this way, uh, through portraiture, very grand portrait in this case, uh, known as, rather ironically, as the Greyhound. It shows Sir Reginald Lister, who was uh, the sort of like, well, in fact, he was the last British minister of the British legation in Tangier. We see him here in his drawing room with El El Elaine Le Lavery. And this is his, this is uh, John Lavery's um, daughter. He has two daughters, but they are from different mothers, just to keep us on our toes. And this is Elaine. Uh, so he marries the beautiful Hazel Trudeau. And Hazel Trudeau, Trudeau is, as the name suggests, a Canadian in terms of who she married, though she sees herself to be very much in favour of Irish republicanism, as we will discover in a minute. But because Hazel is so well connected, uh, Lavery really makes his name as a painter of high society, exemplified by evening Evelyn Farker, who you see here. Uh, in the lower one, it's the artist's studio. So Hazel is here, great socialite. Alice is her daughter. And that, of course, is now her stepdaughter, Elaine. And you'll find this in the National Gallery of Ireland. But in fact, it's painted in Lavery's studio um, in Tangier as you can see from the figure in the background. So uh, I've always uh, wanted to spend more time exploring uh, Lady Lavery, Hazel Trudeau. Uh, Lavery met her in 1904, but she was already uh, betrothed to another, Monsieur Trudeau. But having got married, she was widowed, I won't say quite immediately, but shortly after. And although there was a lot of family opposition, Hazel and, and John Lavery marry in 1909. So I'm showing you here two portraits of the beautiful Hazel, a photograph of it. I mean, she was incredibly well connected. She knew how to work society. And she definitely secured at Lavery a lot of prestigious commissions. Uh, this one, I, ironically, however, with her, uh, originally with her arms naked, was also used as an advert for Pond's Cold Cream. So artists could make a little bit on the side that way as well. And down the bottom is Eileen Lavery of 1909. So she is, in fact, his only daughter uh, from his first wife, who sadly died very young of TB. So here is Hazel. She's become a bit of a pin-up girl uh, for the Irish Republican movement. It's even alleged that she had an affair with Michael Collins. So it's more likely that they are soulmates than bedmates. Uh, she was depicted on the 10 pound note for something like 50 years. And it's based on a portrait, as you see down the bottom, um, by, in fact, uh, Lavery himself. But the, the theme, the, the motif, um, is this famous Irish uh, harpist, she's leaning on her harp, uh, based on a poem by William Butler Yeats. So again, Kathleen was seen to be um, the darling of the uh, nationalists. So she's worthy of a lecture in her own right. Again, precarious health. Um, she dies, she predeceases uh, Lavery, uh, dying in 1935. It's one of the later portraits of her. She was supposed to have the most amazing eyes. 
So with uh, Lavery, we get these extremes. Anna Pavlova, nothing to do with the meringue, but the famous dancer here, a close-up of the painting, which is in Glasgow, shows you again his loose, rapid brushwork. He's sometimes compared to John Singer Sargent. And Amazon, which shows uh, Eileen on a very large horse, that's the Amazon um, in our story, uh, secures his election ARA associate in 1911, and then a full academician in 1921. So of all of the artists that I've been showing you, probably Lavery is the best example of that rags to riches story. Going back to George Henry and Atkinson Hornell, they're on a completely different trajectory because these are this pair of artists are heading for Japan. They are in some ways more experimental than either Guthrie or Walton or Lavery. So here is autumn of 1881, and then we have two panels from a triptych, in fact, that's three panels altogether, simply entitled Spring and Summer. And you can see here what I mean about applying the paint uh, vertically. There's a sort of moodiness to these, poetic, but there's no obvious narrative. And the figure here in autumn is almost lost in the thickly uh, applied impasto paint using the square brush technique. Uh, George Henry appears to be way ahead of his rivals in terms of grappling with the French avant-garde uh, in 1889, producing a Galloway landscape. It's completely out of scale. Uh, one uh, cow appears to have disappeared into a tree. Uh, the pattern of the, well, exactly that is more a pattern than it is a naturalistic use of three-dimensional perspective. And the argument goes that he may have been aware or have seen already uh, the avant-garde works uh, by Gauguin, who is part of another artistic colony at Pontevin in Brittany. So here is the vision after the sermon, which may account for the rather strange size of the cows in the work by George Henry. It's picked up here, as you can see, uh, in the goat herd by Hornell, where you have this uh, bisecting motif of the tree uh, right the way through the image. But most importantly here, look at the thick, rich impasto of the paint, which is partly the influence, of course, of artists like Vincent van Gogh, though Vincent is only really well known after his death in 1890. But there was another artist by the name of Monticelli, who was also painting in this thick, rich impasto way. So they're very cosmopolitan in their outlook and the sources on, from which they draw their own style. So summer here is looking ahead almost to Japan with these motifs here on the girl's dress, but we are still very much in a Scottish idyll and we are still very much using the square brush technique. And this, by the way, is in the Walker Art Gallery at Liverpool. David Gould was at the same time exploring sort of Celtic themes and Japanese themes simultaneously. And he, painting in the late 1880s, is a link to Charles Rennie Mackintosh, who was influenced by his Celticism and mysticism in the 1890s. And that comes to a peak with Atkinson Hornell and George Henry's Druids bringing in the mistletoe of 1890. They actually worked on this together. Please don't ask me who did what. And every time I look at it, I think more of uh, Native American Indians, if you don't mind me saying so, uh, particularly that figure there in the center uh, than Druids. And perhaps most interesting of all is the application of gold. Uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the canvas here, seen particularly in the jewels worn uh, by the Druids. So Celtic, the Celtic theme, the mystical theme, so these would belong very much to what is known as European symbolism, which was thriving um, around about 1890. So if we look carefully at the back of this portrait of Atkinson Hornell, painted by Bessie McNichol, She's my token Glasgow girl, by the way, simply for lack of space to fit them in. Uh, Bessie McNichol, again, sadly, uh, dies young. She dies uh, from the consequences of childbirth in 1904. But here we have her portrait of Atkinson Hornell, and I'm hoping that you are noticing all the Japanese figures in the background. There's a geisha here, and then there are figures that appear to be dancing or wrestling, but the important thing is the link to Japan. 
So this is just a, a random Japanese print that I chose. Um, it's actually a 19th century one. As you can see, I've given you the name of the artist there, Otawaga. Uh, but I mean, it shows you that these, um, you tend to think of them as 18th century, but these Japanese prints were very affordable because they were being produced right the way through the 19th century. And everybody collected them, particularly Macintosh. And uh, to emphasize the cultural connections, the Japanese Navy was being built on the Clyde at the time. So the Japanese print, uh, the impact of it, their interest in Japanese art, uh, means that Hornell and Henry actually go to Tokyo in 1893. To go so early is still quite unusual, and they would have been very much policed when they got there. Deep suspicion on the part of the Japanese to anybody from the West. But I love these images, because now dating to mid-1890s, you can definitely see uh, some of the influence of Vincent van Gogh coming through um, in the application, the thick application of the paint. So figures with lanterns and a bridge. This is uh, the balcony Yokohama. And this is just, I love this one, I love her hair. But this is uh, the famous one uh, by Claude Monet of his wife in Japanese uh, attire and the fans behind, which dates to 1875. It's just to remind you that this other really important influence on French Impressionism in general is the Japanese print. And if you've ever been to visit Monet's garden, you'll know that you're going to be seeing lots of Japanese prints when you get there. They were a huge impact or had a huge influence on his compositions. So uh, the Glasgow boys are influenced by Japanese prints, so too the Scottish colorists, so we'll meet them in just a minute. So here is Samuel Peplow, flowers and uh, fruit with a Japanese background, interior with a Japanese print, I love the bowler hat. And this is George Leslie Hunter's still life with a Japanese print. It's to show a very obvious link between the two. I love this one by uh, Henry, because I always think her fan looks almost like it's, um, uh, you know, um, where the artist has been laying out his colours on, on, on a palette. Beautiful application of the paint. And uh, Henry doesn't do so well out of it, I'm afraid. Uh, and many of his beautiful images, like At Home in Japan, were in watercolour, and they did not survive the treacherous journey back to Glasgow. Whereas Atkinson Hornell, working in oil, well, he really st steals the show when he gets these back home to Glasgow in the mid-1890s. So flying a kite here uh, really is, is a exemplary of, of the way in which he has adapted uh, modern art styles, the application of the paint, the interesting colour and form to a Japanese subject. It's not these, however, that make him fabulously wealthy. It's painting little girls like the bluebell wood here, and particularly painting them on the seashore. He develops these subjects in the 1890s. And to be quite honest, it's these that really uh, ensure um, his success as an artist and enable him to buy up most of Kukubri. And this one dates Blue Bellwood to about 1910. Another link between the boys and the colorists is Arthur Melville. And it was Arthur Melville who encouraged Lavery uh, to acquire or to go to Tangier and then undoubtedly acquire his house there. So here's the sharp or the spectacular change um, in colour between the Cabbage School, at Arthur Melville Hill, 1877, and then Arthur Melville again, the Sapphire Sea at Northern Spain. And the dramatic uh, foreshortened perspective here, again, is the influence of the Japanese prints. So, of course, what holds the colorists together is exactly that, color. I'm just going to concentrate on three of them. So this is uh, Samuel Peplow, Landscape in Cassis. You could have had a whole lecture on just all the artists that paint at grace sur those that paint at pont a and those who go to Cassis in the south of France. Paul Seignac, Henri Matisse, Vanessa Bell and Duncan Grant all head to Cassis. Macintosh, in fact, by 1923, is also in France. But rather than the sort of um, Prov Provencal area that you're in here, I mean, he was around on the Spanish side, if I can put it that way, at Coulure and Port Vendre. So unfortunately, there was no interconnection as far as I know. Now, this generation have moved on. So they're going to be influenced initially by Paul Cézanne, 
So this is a Big Trees of 1902. And again, when Suzanne dies in 1906, there are huge retrospective ex exhibitions of his work, which exert an even greater influence on contemporary artists. And it is, of course, uh, through um, Suzanne that we develop Cubism. So here are the Scottish colorists. J.D. Ferguson, John Duncan Ferguson, and Samuel Peplow are very close friends. I'm going to concentrate on those with a bit about Caddle. You pronounce it not Caddell, but Caddle in the Scottish. And he, uh, slightly younger, oh, uh, he comes, as you can see, he's born in 1883. The others are about 10 years earlier in terms of their birth, Ferguson and Peplow. But Hunter doesn't really fit in. He's not they're only called the Scottish colorists because they exhibit together in 1924 and then again in 1925. So in my story, as I'm like trying to tell you, um, Leslie Hunter is a bit of an outcast. He's on the fringes, if I can put it that way. So because the other three are so interconnected, I'm going to concentrate on them for the last uh, 15 minutes of my talk. Uh, so they initially, they are very influenced by Manet, not Monet, but Edouard Manet, who's part of the first flush of French Impressionism, which was really uh, much more rooted in realism. You can also see here the influence of Dutch still life painting. So we have Peplow's The Black Bottle, we have Hunter's Peeled Lemon, and we have Manet's Fruits and Grapes down the bottom. They're all trying to do much the same thing, particularly the sparkling white tablecloth against which you have the uh, darker objects uh, casting their shadow and all executed in a very painterly style. Hunter's Peeled Lemon shows the particular influence, I think, of Dutch still life painting. This is the same uh, story, but now we're looking at flowers. So roses in a blue and white vase with a black background is Peplow. Ferguson is giving us at the top John Quills and Silver. And then down the bottom we have Hunter again uh, with a porcelain vase and a Japanese figure. And there's the Manet, not Monet, but Manet flowers in the corner. And all of these are still lives and they're quite dark. And I think you'll agree with me. There's more than a little touch of the Dutch still life about them. But when we go outdoors, of course, the story is quite different. Now we're painting directly from nature out of doors. This is actually a wonderful uh, sketch um, of the Isle of Barra, which is where Peplow uh, meets his wife. So he's traveling again in a brotherhood with his own brother, Willie, and Robert Cowan Robertson. And they first go to the Isle of Barra in 1894. And they'll go backwards and forwards to Barra uh, many summers until 1905. This particular sketch, thick, richly painted, in pasto, you can see every single brush mark, as you can see, um, is in the Kelvin Grove collection. So he meets his wife, Margaret McKay. Now, I just like this story. It's got a nice bit of human warmth to it on Barra, where she's in the post office uh, working. Uh, they are engaged for a very long time. Uh, she will transfer to Edinburgh, and they won't, in fact, get married until the opening years of the uh, 20th century. Here she is painted by her affianced in a style again that is very reminiscent in some ways of Whistler and in others of Singer Sargent. But I do love Windy Day Barra of uh, 1903. Again, more, uh, these are really, um, this was him having fun, um, you know, over the holidays, sort of painting what he wanted as opposed to what he thought might be commercial. And he also went to Iona uh, equally uh, to Barra. And here again, a wonderfully uh, good example of the square brush. Look at these big, chunky, uh, every, you know, every brushwork. You can see the individual brush stroke. It's choppy, it's thick, it's in pasto. This is typical of the way they worked, um, particularly around about 1900 to 1905. Now, Peplow and Ferguson are drawn, like so many, uh, to Paris. So we find them in northern France, backwards and forwards again from 1904 onwards. Paris Plage is at the coast, uh, and this is in the Fleming collection. This is this bank that amassed an amazing collection of Glasgow boys and Scottish colourists, which sadly is no longer open to the public, but you can see their collections online, and they lend a lot. Can you see here how you can even see the canvas coming through in some places? 
or paper. You know, the, in a way, the background becomes part of the image. That's all part of this uh, painterly revolution. So again, a sketch. And there is no doubt that even at, at this late stage that Whistler is exerting his for, uh, a force. Because, of course, there was a huge retrospective for when he died in 1909. Everybody remembered his infamous white girl, uh, which dates to 1863, which was for many artists a good excuse to try and have an essay in whites on white. And Peplow's Girl in White dates to 1907. Again, look how rich and thick and painterly it is. It's almost like cream being applied to the canvas. And uh, Peplow very much belongs to a sort of generation of what is referred to as the alternative moderns. Uh, so we have John Singer Sargent himself, represented by Lady Agnew, and one of the Spanish artists who I'm particularly fond of, called Soroya, who is based in Valencia, to show you that they were sort of like alongside the real, well, I suppose the real avant-garde is going too far, but alongside the avant-garde that we're used to, i.e. Impressionism and then post-Impressionism, which is particularly uh, Gauguin and Van Gogh, we have this other group of moderns who are sort of walking between the traditional and the avant-garde, seeing a sergeant at Soroya and Peplow. And then what really turns the tide is Roger Fry's exhibition of Impressionism and Post-Impressionism held in London in 1910. This uh, uh, introduces everybody to the most up-to-date avant-garde art coming out of uh, France. Now, having said that, the Gauguin dates to 1899. Uh, Manet, Cézanne, Gauguin, Van Gogh, and above all, Matisse, who is a member of this new group known as the Fauves or the Wild Men. And then there's a second exhibition in 1912. I'm always amused by the fact that Roger Fry stuck it out. The first exhibition was so badly received, you sort of wonder why he inflicted pain on himself again in 1912. At the top, we have a painting by Roger Fry, River, Rivers with Poplars in the Tate, showing particularly the influence of Matisse, large blocks of colour, and then the inevitable influence of Cezanne. So Cezanne definitely gives us the, this cubist element, which uh, develops in art from about 1907 onwards. So we find a lot of artists, again, benefiting from the atelier system in Paris. They go to the Académie Julienne and even more so the Académie Colorossi, which is where all the avant-garde really hung out. Uh, Camille Claudel, who was the mistress and model of Rodin, Paul Gauguin himself, and Peplow um, settles, in fact, in Paris for two years from 1910 to 1912. By that stage, Ferguson was already there, enjoying cafe society, like the Café de Harcourt, uh, which was, you know, where all the intellectuals got together. It's not just about painters, it's about writers and philosophers, as you're about to discover. But as in the late 19th century, it's all about cafe society. In the Luxembourg Gardens here, uh, on the left-hand side, sketches uh, from that year that he moves to Paris. He's now at last married the love of his life. And he will come, he will become involved with an avant-garde group that focus on a magazine called Rhythm. Rhythm was, um, everybody gets involved with it, writers, artists, and uh, it was a, a very much a, um, a magazine ex as a platform for the latest ideas in terms of aesthetics. Again, focusing very much on form and color. So moving right the way away from that whole idea that art should be didactic or tell a story. So in the Luxembourg Gardens here, uh, so painting in and around Paris, but then the higher key achieved uh, when they head south. And we know that by 1913, Ferguson and Estelle Rice, who is an artist, and Peplow and his family have discovered Cassis. And for a comparison for my foves, I've got Turning of the Road. Uh, here, this is the Turning of the Road uh, by uh, André Dorin. And then we've got the Mountains of Kalua, also down the bottom uh, by Darin. Remember, it is at Kalua uh, that Mackintosh is painting, and it's from 1923 to his death in 1928. So I'm making a link for you so you can see where Mackintosh fits in.
Uh, so in terms of developing his uh, style and his really the bedrock of his uh, practice as an artist, Peplo goes back to still life. And he begins to move uh, through, as you can see, uh, fauve colors. So fauve artists, thick application of paint, but very bright colors, as you can see. And as we move through these images, they tend to be very um, repetitive, bowl of fruit, flowers, perhaps some sort of fabric in the background. They, began, they begin to get more angular, as you can see. So tulips and cup here shows very much the influence of Van Gogh, that chrome yellow, sunflowers, and then the still life of 1913, clearly in the influence of Cubism, which has been around, in fact, for several years, since, two, since 1907. And then two that have recently passed through the auction rooms, don't think, and think about buying one. They are now, you know, in their millions. Um, but still life, apples and jar. I'm trying to show you here how the colours start to move, move away in some ways from these very bold colours to more subdued ones. Here's another one, equally subdued from 1916, and very angular, as you can see in its forms, a bit of Cezanne coming through. But it's really that pop of colour that many people found very startling, particularly immediately after the First World War. This quote is from a contemporary patron who will eventually buy works by Peplo, but he's telling us here how they just seem so modern uh, because of their formal manner. So the bright colours and the shapes. So as Roger Fry and Clive, Pell, Clive Bell put it, the important thing, sorry that was too loud, the important thing was significant form. And many people simply didn't understand it, even in the 1920s. Still Life with Roses and Tulips and Fruit uh, passing through Christie's will show you how important the blue and white bar still is. Um, in terms of still life. And he carries on in this vein until he dies quite young um, in the mid 1930s. Lots of roses, that becomes a motif. And I think, as you can see, the colors become more muted. Ferguson goes through a similar sort of tra trajectory. Um, he starts off being very influenced by Whistler, as you can see here, Girl by a Flower Stall, not the way it's painted, but the subject matter. And its uh, composition is very Whistlerian, even more so um, the uh, nocturne, uh, which you know goes got all of the sort of moody uh, wistfulness that you associate with Whistler's images of the Thames in particular. And he gets to Paris even earlier uh, than Peplo. You can see that some of his works, like Dieppe, 14th of July, Bastille Day, 1905, are a direct homage uh, to Whistler. In this case, the Falling Rocket which was shown back in 1877. And uh, the nice thing about Ferguson is he has a, a rich love life. So this was his first muse and lover, Jean, and the painting on the left is known as the cock feather, a reference to the hat. And there's Jean in a white dress. Again, we've gone back to that little white girl theme, courtesy of Whistler. And this is uh, Jean again, again in a wonderful hat. But look at the way in which his style, this is Ferguson, his style will change. So this is um, 1902 and this is 1907. So he's already seen a work by Matisse, which has introduced the green shadows in particular and the uh, sort of startlingly unrealistic application of, of the light and the colour. And of course, this is where it's coming from. So this is Henri Matisse's image of his wife, by the way, the original is in Copenhagen. And what is really important is that green shadow coming down the middle of her nose and then casting the shadow, very green shadow, on the left-hand side. And Ferguson's tried to pick up on that in his own rendering of Jean McConaughey's face. So this is the influence of the foes. Oops, sorry, got stuck. So he gets, uh, Ferguson is very thick with the artistic avant-garde in Paris. So here he is painting, in fact, Bertha Case, who was a friend and fellow artist. Elizabeth Dryden was an American mm -hmm. who settled in Paris. She was there, uh, courtesy of her employer, at least the famous Mr. Wanamaker, uh, who ran a department store 
and he wanted copy and <coughs> images uh, for his trade and magazine. But you can see immediately, can't you, a higher key of color in terms of the, uh, you know, going from this, sorry, going quickly uh, to that. Uh, so Anne Estelle Rice was his lover uh, whilst in Paris. She was also a great friend of the writer Catherine Mansfield. So it was very much a tight-knit avant-garde group. Lovely description of her here. Uh, this is Anne Estelle Rice, um, who was madly in love with Ferguson until she was ousted by Margaret Morris. I love that. You know she is an exceptional woman, so gay, so abundant, in the full flow just now, and really beautiful to watch. I think they probably had a, an element of exotica, um, as these women were American. Uh, so I, in the case of Catherine Mansfield, she's from New Zealand. She'd, as I say, again, this is Anne Estelle Rice. She'd also been sent to Paris uh, by the Wanamaker magazine. So it was a joint uh, sort of like uh, arrangement. So Elizabeth, who we just met in the previous slide, Elizabeth Dryden here did the text. And Anne Estelle Rice did the illustrations. She was also quite a talented um, sculptor, I'm led to believe. Right. So again, this is just a, very, a good example of the befores and the afters. So um, hat with bird, which is obviously the amazing, you know, I'm not quite sure I'd like to wear that, but the main thing is a wonderful hat. And uh, the white ruff. So here he is being Whistler. And here he is virtually the same year, 1907, after he's been Matisse. And the Closerie de Lilas uh, was, again, a favourite watering hole, where you'd find Gertrude Stein, Picasso, Henry James, the famous novelist, Hemingway and Brock. So you can imagine how heady it must have been um, living in the avant-garde circles in Paris in the opening years of the 20th century. Here's uh, Anne Estelle Rice again. And wherever you see Closerie de Lilas, it's likely to be the, the setting for the portrait. I do love the uh, Chinese uh, cloak, or I should say coat. And this is actually by an Estelle Rice at the end. So these two in blue are by Ferguson, but the one at the end is Catherine Mansfield herself, the famous writer and great friend of Anne Estelle Rice. I love this one, I love these hats. This is the blue hat at, again, the Closerie de Lilas. And the model in this case uh, had worked in a hat shop. She falls in with all these avant-garde artists and eventually marries one, the American sculptor, Joe Davidson. So getting in with the artist was obviously good, furthering uh, your potential in society. So this little group here shows you particularly the influence of Matisse on Ferguson. The blue nude is at the top. And then at my studio window over here is by Ferguson. And uh, he will become increasingly influenced by rhythm and dance. So this is entitled Rhythm from 1911. He gets very heavily involved with this journal uh, launched by John Middleton Murray. Um, it was to put forward the ideas of the philosopher uh, Henri-Louis Bergson, who was into the elan or life vital and vitalism. He believed in the creative evolution and Rhythm, the magazine, becomes the focus and the vehicle for all these radical ideas. I think that's two people dancing up there, but I think they've lost their clothes along the way. And the most famous of these works is uh, the nudes that you see here. And remember that this is the era of Isadora Duncan, we have the Ballet Russe uh, performing in Paris from 1909. So it's not surprising that dance and rhythm become such a focus of Ferguson's art. So here's the size, because you have a good idea of how big the painting is. And we can link it to Matisse's famous image of the dance. You see how they're all um, exploring the same motif, and motifs, uh, this motif by Matisse is the same era, 1909 to 1910. So this is uh, Léon Basque for the uh, Ballet Russe. And it's just to remind you, that it's all interconnected. The ballets of Diaghilev, um, well, the music of uh, Stravinsky, uh, Rimsky-Korsakov. This is his uh, muse and lover, uh, Margaret Morris, uh, about to dance uh, her own ballet, known simply as Spring, in a costume designed by Ferguson. Remember that poor Anne Estelle Rice is dropped 
uh, when I'm afraid Margaret Morris comes on the scene. So Hymn to the Sun, it takes us through into what you and I might call Art Deco. And the plenitude, which just means, you know, fruitfulness of the olive um, is rather conveniently for me actually executed in um, olive wood. But it's just to again show you the interconnectedness of the arts at this stage, you know, writers, musicians, painters and sculptors. And here is uh, Margaret Morris. So she was uh, very much in tune with um, Isadora Duncan. She was actually trained by Isadora Duncan's brother. She took it a little further. It was more athletic, more Greek, and she has a huge influence on Ferguson's development as an artist. And my last of my Fergusons, we're just quickly time to look at Cadell or Caddle. Oh, we've got Blonde with a Checked Sundress from 1958, because he lives much longer than the, the rest in the group. What a, a, a trip, as it were. What a change from the portrait of Jean McConaughey from 1904. Just nice to show. So I'm going to finish off with some ravishing works by Cadell. He's slightly younger. He's only 16 when they encourage him uh, to go to Paris. Again, he's very much encouraged uh, by Melville, who we've met already. Um, and, uh, you know, he is, I suppose, what you would call a bit of a protege. Uh, so here he is in St. Mark's Square, 1910. And I just love, again, the liquidity and the fluidity and the impasto character of the application of the paint. Love that blue sky as well. I've always wanted to put bubbles into this. This is Cadell again, taking on that lavery subject and guthery subject of painting society. And he does it very well. In a still, I think you'll agree, rather Whistlerian palette, quite muted compared, of course, to that view of Venice. And he specializes really in mirrors. So reflections uh, by Caddle. Here he's showing particularly the influence of Whistler with his Symphony in White Number no. Two, a much earlier, 1864. But it's that wistful woman looking in the mirror, perhaps thinking about the past, contemplating a blue china. I love that part. And it's almost a, it's almost like a reworking, isn't it? Using the fluid brushwork of the opening years of the 20th century. He has a muse. Um, I haven't misspelt that, that's Bethia, that is her name. Uh, independently wealthy. Uh, so again, she, he has a muse and a lover. And again, please note the importance of the mirror with the cheval glass in the background, cheval glass. And again, you can make these links between Cadell, or sorry, Caddle and uh, Peplo. So here they are painting together on Iona. Caddle first went to Iona in 1912 and he goes there on and off for the next 20 years. And it was a sanctuary very much for Peplo after the war, who declares when the war is over, I shall go to the Hebrides and recover some of the vision I have lost. So, uh, you know, these bold images of Cassis again, we've already seen how the glass, uh, the glass, sorry, the, glass, the colorists discover uh, Cassis in the early 1920s. And again, you can see the obvious influence here of Suzanne in the bold blocks of color. So here again, emphasizing how they're all painting together at Cassis. We have Peplo from 1924 and Ferguson from 1922, which is very cubist, isn't it, in its composition. So I'm very fond of these last images by Caddle. Lady in Black, which is the one uh, here uh, where again, the white, the, the wonderful hat dominates a society woman very much from 1927, as is the orange blind, uh, where we have a pianist in the background. But what I want you to notice in this little sequence as we finish is how we move away from this painterly uh, technique to a much more linear one, exemplified here um, in the blue fan. And uh, these have recently again uh, passed through Christie's. So flat, rather pattern-like, almost like wallpaper, he will settle at six at Ainsley Place in Edinburgh, which features in many of the images. And you can see here how this shift in style, bolder colors, flat patterning, that sort of painterly technique appears to be uh, brought into check. Again, the still life subjects as in Peplo. And here's a really good example of the way in which his technique has changed to something tighter and more linear. 
So the black hat of 1914 is down the bottom, very whistler, very thickly, richly painted, and portrait of a lady in black is from 1921. So I leave you with this last slide, this rapid and slightly over the time uh, perusal of, uh, or rapid in fact, uh, chronology of painting in Glasgow uh, and Edinburgh right the way through because the Glasgow boys are very much Glasgow and the Scottish colourists are very much Edinburgh, as I've already mentioned with uh, cattle uh, settling there. But it's this transition, you know, I've taken you through Impressionism, Naturalism, we've had a stab at Cubism and Fauvism, but sadly of the Scottish colourists, it's only really Ferguson who progresses into the post-Second World War era. So I'm leaving you here with Ferguson's wonderful image of Margaret Morris from 1952 of Danu, Mother of the Gods. You can still see some influence, can't you, of Cezanne and uh, the Cubists there. Whereas the embroidered cloak by Cadell, I just gain love, almost like Art Deco. Whenever I look at that, uh, image, or, I, or rather think of Tamara de Lempica.